Okay, hi, yeah, it's uh, Mr. T here. So uh, here's a video going over all that we need to know for uh, Achievement Standard 2.4, which is an external exam for Level 2 NCA. It's on bonding structure properties and energy changes. Um, it's Achievement Standard 91164. This video especially has been asked for from Georgia and Pia. So good luck with your exams tomorrow. So before I can um, draw a Lewis dot diagram, I need to know the electron configuration for the atoms that I'm using so I can calculate the number of valence electrons or the electrons in the outside shell. To calculate uh, or to work out the electron configuration, the first thing I have to do is find the atomic number of an atom in the product table. And then the number of the atomic number is equal to the number of electrons in a neutral atom. Once I know that, I can use the following rule, that is that electrons are arranged in shells around the nucleus, um, with the innermost shell being called shell one, the next two, and so on, and that each shell can hold a certain number of electrons. Shell one, the innermost, can hold two, shell two can hold eight, shell three can hold eight, and shell four can hold the rest of them. So if I wanted to draw the electron arrangement for the atom chlorine, um, I could draw it in the following way. It has 17 electrons, so I put two in the first shell, eight in the next one, and then I only have seven left after I've filled uh, two and eight in the middle, so I put them on the third shell. I would write the electron configuration of this as two, comma, eight, comma, seven. That represents the um, arrangement of electrons in this diagram. Here's another example of oxygen here. Oxygen is atom number eight, so it has eight electrons. I put two in the innermost shell, and I put six in the next shell. I don't have any left to complete that shell or to go into the third shell, so I can draw its electron configuration. And that is two comma six. So these are the, simple, the simplified rules if we need to draw electron configuration for the first 20 atoms, let's say. So if we can quickly draw the electron configuration for an atom using the shorthand, we can calculate the number of valence electrons or electrons in the outside shell. So let's have a look at uh, a few examples. So here we can see the electron arrangement of the atoms in group one. This is the first group on the periodic table, uh, the group highlighted in yellow here. Now hydrogen has an electron arrangement or configuration of one, lithium two comma one, sodium two eight one, and potassium two eight eight one. Notice that this column every atom in this column has the outside number of electrons as one. That is, the valence electrons are one. Let's have a look at another example. So if we take group 17, here's group 17 on the right. The electron arrangement of the atoms in group 17, or electron configuration, is for fluorine, 27, for chlorine, 2187, and in fact, every atom in this column has seven valence electrons. So there's a pattern here. So if I start from the left, there are one, there's one valence electron for everything in the first column. There are two valence electrons for everything in the second column. There are three for everything in column 13, four and 14, 15 and six, and fifth, sorry, five, 15, six and 16, and in 18, we have eight. So this is a really quick way if you want to work out how many valence electrons are found in an atom. We just look up the column it is on the periodic table, and we just take the number that is at the right of the group number. That is, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so let's just have a think about this. So what an atom wants to do, so fundamentally, atoms want to 
have a full valence shell. Their outside shell, they want to collect eight in their outside shell. There are two ways they can do this. They can either swap electrons, that's donate or accept electrons, or they can share electrons. Now, when we draw Lewis diagrams, we're going to actually draw bonds where they share electrons. Now, the reason, remember, they want to share electrons atoms is to get eight in the outside shell. So let's look at a couple of atoms. So the first atom I'm going to draw here is chlorine. Chlorine, as we saw before, has 17 electrons and it has seven in its outside shell. Now I can draw another atom here called hydrogen. Hydrogen has a valence of one, so it's got one electron in its outer shell. Um, interestingly, hydrogen, because it only has the first level, it doesn't want to get eight in its outside shell. It is an exception. It wants to get two in its shell because it's actually the first shell. The first shell holds two, the second eight, and the third eight. And those shells, the atoms want to get those shells full. So what they do here is you can see that the hydrogen and the chlorine are going to share two electrons between them. And by doing that, chlorine gets eight in its outside shell and hydrogen gets two. They complete their octet and they now formed a sharing bond or what we call a covalent bond. Now, oxygen can do this as well. Oxygen can actually share electrons with another oxygen atom. So here I've drawn two oxygen atoms, but oxygen atoms have eight, a valence shell of six electrons, sorry, because they have eight electrons in total. And they want eight in the outside. In order to collect eight, what the oxygen atoms do is they share two pairs of electrons. And by doing that, we can count that now this oxygen atom has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And the one on the right has eight electrons in its valence shell. It's completed its octet and it's full. Interestingly, though, it now has two pairs of electrons shared. And it would form a covalent bond, but what we call a double bond, because it is sharing two pairs instead of one pair of electrons. Atoms can share one pair, two pairs, or even three pairs of electrons when they form a covalent bond. Now, just as we're looking at these atoms here, we can see these two pairs of electrons that I've highlighted in green that aren't involved in bonding, and of course these other ones on the left-hand side for oxygen, and the outside valence shell, they are called non-bonding electron pairs, because sometimes they're called lone pairs as well, because they're not bonding. Okay, let's get into drawing lower structures. So when we draw Lewis structures, the first thing we need to do is count the total number of valence electrons in a molecule. We arrange the atoms in a way that we put the one that we think most likely is going to be in the center of the molecule in the middle and the others around, around that atom. We give each of the outside atoms eight electrons in the outside shell. We give any extra electrons left over to the central atom and we check that each so that the central atom has eight electrons if not we move electron pairs to make double or triple bonds let's look at some examples of these but before we do there are three exceptions to the central atoms central atoms all want to have eight electrons around them except for hydrogen that only wants two beryllium that only wants four and boron that only wants six. So um, I'm going to draw the Lewis structure for this uh, molecule here with hydrogen, oxygen and chlorine. Um, the first thing I need to do is I'm going to count the total number of valence electrons. So I go to my periodic table and I find that hydrogen is in column one, oxygen in column six and chlorine in column seven. So I add, sorry, Oxygen is 16, so it has six valence electrons. Chlorine is 17, so it has seven valence electrons. So I add one plus six plus seven, and I get 14 valence electrons. I then arrange the atoms to put the, I put one of these atoms in the middle. It's going to be oxygen. So usually how it goes, carbon is usually in the middle. If carbon isn't there, I'm going to put uh, nitrogen in the middle. If nitrogen is not there, I'm going to put oxygen in the middle. Now there's a reason for that, but I won't go over that at the moment. 
So I put oxygen in the middle and hydrogen and chlorine around it. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a bond between them because we know that there's going to be a bond here, a covalent bond, because we're drawing Lewis structures. And I'm going to make sure that I give eight electrons to the chlorine because the outside atoms need eight, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't, it just needs two. Now, when we're counting the total number of electrons, each line represents two electrons. So I'm going to put, I've got two around the hydrogen, so that's complete, the outside. I'm now going to add another two around chlorine to give me four, six, eight. So I now have my outside atoms with their full valence shells. So I put any electrons I have left around the oxygen. At the moment, I've used two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. So I have four more to put. I'm going to put them in pairs around the oxygen. Here we go. One, two, and I've now used all 14 electrons. Notice that I can only add electrons in pairs. OK, they can only be added in pairs. Now I have to check the central atom. I'm just going to double check that it has only eight electrons. Unless it was beryllium, where it would have four, or remember if it was boron and it would have six. So I have one, two, three, four pairs of electrons. So that's eight electrons. So everything's good. That's our completed Lewis structure. Oh, sorry. I just put the circles around to double check. And this is what our Lewis structure looks like. Another example. So the next, exa next example is going to be uh, carbon sulfide. Uh, so here I have, um, I count the total number of electrons. I've got carbon, which is in group 14, so it has four electrons. Sulfur is in group 16, so it has six electrons. So I'm going to have uh, four from one carbon and six from each of the sulfurs gives me 16 in total, four plus six plus six. I'm going to put the carbon in the middle here to make my atom symmetrical. And I always put carbons in the middle if they're present. And I'm going to put the sulfurs around the outside. In this case, I could draw a line here, but it's also acceptable just to put uh, a pair of electrons in between like this. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to put electrons around the sulfur first. So I'm going to give it eight. So we've got two here. I'm going to put eight around the other sulfur. And now notice I've used 16 electrons. So I'm that looks like I've completed. I've used all the 16 electrons to put around the outside atoms, but I need to check to see whether the central atom, the outside atoms have eight. I'll check that. Yes, yes. But how many around the center atom? There is only four. I need to have eight around the central atom. So what has to happen is the carbon has to share another pair of electrons with the sulfur on the right and another pair of the electrons with the sulfur on the left. So I have to move a pair from each of the sulfur, sulfur atoms and put them in the middle. I'm going to move this pair on the left and this pair on the right, and I'm going to place them in the middle, and it's going to look like this. This is my diagram for drawing this molecule. I'm going to replace these dots in the middle now with lines, so I will have this Lewis diagram at the end here. Now remember, the third Lewis diagram is totally acceptable, but the one at the bottom is, is a better looking diagram because we can see the actual double bonds. OK, let's look at a, a, a last example here of Lewis structures. We have uh, this boron uh, trifluoride. So we have one boron, which is in group 13, so it has three electrons. And we have fluorine, which is in group 17, so it has seven valence electrons, but there are three of them. Three sevens are 21 plus three. There's 24 electrons in total. So I'm going to arrange the atoms. I'm going to put the B in the middle and the three Fs around the outside. One, two, three. I'm going to give each outside F eight electrons. Two, four, six, eight, two four, six, eight, and then the other um, fluorine also gets those six electrons. Now, in this case, I'm just going to check that I used all my electrons, so eight plus eight, so let me go here, eight plus another eight plus another eight, three eights, 24, yep, 
I've used all my electrons. I've got eight around each of the outside atoms, so that's good. But I'm supposed to have eight around the center, except remember for beryllium that can have four and boron that has six. So in this case, for this special example, because it's boron trifluoride, this is actually a correct Lewis structure. I'm going to redraw it with the single lines instead of the dots here. And this is my Lewis structure. Now remember, hydrogens can have two, beryllium's four in the valence shell, and boron can has, have six. We've learnt how to draw Lewis structures. We can use the Lewis structures to find the shapes of molecules. And that's uh, this next chapter of the video is what we're going to be looking at. So shapes of uh, molecules is really a geometric uh, sort of exercise. You need to feel comfortable with geometry. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's called a central atom. And uh, also we're going to be looking at the groups of electrons around the central atom to explain what the shape is of any given molecule. So these are the, uh, the different shapes that we're going to have to explain as we go through this next part of the video. So here is a molecule that we've drawn, a Lewis structure of carbon dioxide. Notice that around the central carbon atom, we've got two uh, double bonds between the carbon and the oxygen on the right. And sorry, a double bond between the carbon and oxygen on the right and a double bond between the carbon and oxygen on the left. Now, these two regions, uh, these two groups of electrons, because a double bond is four electrons, two pairs in total, and we have two of these groups around the carbon atom. We call this region, this bonding region here, um, an electron density region electron density region because it's a region we're likely to find electrons so there's a, a dense concentration of them here between the carbon and oxygen on the other side between the other carbon and oxygen there are two of these regions and they're around the central carbon atom now these two regions because they're negative charges they're going to push away from each other we say they mutually repel because they're both negative they push apart from each other as far as possible, and they're going to make a 180 degrees angle, and they're going to make this shape, this linear shape, or this base linear shape. And because both of these regions are bonding, sometimes they can be non-bonding one, but in this case it's bonding, and we call this uh, a linear base shape. Now, here is an example uh, of what a, a molecule that is a linear shape might look like in three dimensions. And I'm just going to go over an acronym that I might use to help you if you want to explain in a paragraph why carbon dioxide is the, sh is the shape it is from the lowest structure. And I use the acronym CERASBO. CERASBO, with, I start with C. C is, I'm going to remember that C, I need to write and talk about the central atom for a start. E for Cerasbo is, I'm going to talk about that the central atom has electron density regions around it. R is that these electron density regions repel from each other as far as possible. Um, A, Cerasbo, A is that the angles, I'm going to say what the angle is from the repulsion of these regions. In this case, it's 180 degrees for a linear shape. I'm going to talk about the base shape. So S, Seraz, is for the base shape. And then I'm going to talk about um, the bonding regions in particular. There are two bonding regions here, Seraz, and then overall shape. What is the overall shape? Now, you're going to notice there's going to be a distinctive distance, a difference between the base shape and an overall shape at times, but not all right ways. So I'm going to make sure you remember the word Serasbo so that I will do each of those six components when I explain the shape of the molecule. Let's look at the shapes that originate from a trigonal planar base shape. So a trigonal planar base shape um, looks a bit like this, the Lewis structure. So this carbon atom has one, two, three electron density regions around it. Now one of these electron density regions is a single bond. Oh, sorry, two of them are single bonds and one is double bond. It doesn't matter that they are 
different sizes of different numbers of electrons in each of these regions or these groups. They repel from each other as much as possible. So the central carbon atom is surrounded by three electron density regions. These regions are going to mutually repel from each other as far as possible. They're going to push away from each other as far as possible. And they produce in a trigonal plane a base shape 120 degree angles. Now that means that this, this overall molecule has a base shape of trigonal planar, but because all of the bonds are the electron density regions, its overall shape is actually still um, trigonal planar as well. And in three dimensions, the molecule is going to look at like this one here at the bottom. So you can see the atom in the middle and the three atoms around the outside. So if, remember, I want to explain the shape of this again, I can use the acronym here, um, SERASBO. So I'm central, going to talk about the central atom, how many electron density regions are around it, that they repel as far as possible, give the angles that they will be at when they repel, 120 degrees for trigonal planar, um, talk about what the base shape is, here it's trigonal planar, how many of the regions are actually bonds compared to non-bonding, there are three, and so the overall shape is also trigonal. Let's look at a different shape. This is um, based on what's called a trigonal planar base shape. So let's have a look at um, this molecule here. So this is sulfur dioxide. I've drawn a Lewis structure for sulfur dioxide. If you uh, remember the first chapter, we talked about Lewis structures. Go back there if you want to look to see how I did this. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify how many groups of electrons around the central sulfur atom. There is one double bond here, another single bond here, and another double bond here. This actually should really be a single bond, but that's all right. So the central sulfur atom in this case has three groups of electrons or three electron density regions, one, two, three around the central atoms. Now, when these three regions push away from each other as far as possible, they're going to make a two-dimensional shape called a trigonal planar shape. Now, these regions will repel as far as each other as possible to produce a 120 degree angle. This is a trigonal planar base shape, but because only two out of the three regions are actually involved in the bond, one is a non-bonding or a lone pair, so only two are involved in the bond, the shape actually looks like a bent shape or a V shape. Because on the top of the sulfur atom here, there is actually a lone pair of electrons pushing against the bonding pairs. Now remember, if I want to remember all the components I'm going to use to explain this, I'm going to use the acronym um, SERASBO. And what that means here is I'm going to remember that I've got the central sulfur atom surrounded by three electron density regions that repel as much as possible at angles of 120 degrees. My base shape is trigonal planar. And my, there are two bonding regions, however, so my overall shape is bent. Okay, so let's look at a, a different shape here. So this is called a tetrahedral base shape. So I might have um, a configuration where I have one, two, three, four, uh, elect three, four bonds around a central atom. Now, usually I'm not going to draw it this way. I'm going to have them at 90 degrees, a two-dimensional structure. Sometimes we'll see them already drawn three-dimensional like this. So there are, um, this central carbon atom has one, two, three, four electron density regions around it. These regions are going to re repel as far as possible from each other. They actually produce an angle of 109 degrees when they push away from each other because they are not, these angles here are 109 degrees because they are optimized for three dimensions, not for two dimensions. If these four different arms or bonds coming off the carbon in three dimensions, 
move as far away as possible, they will produce 109 degree angles. This base shape here is called tetrahedral. Um, but because there is one, two, three, four, all of the four regions are bonding regions, the overall shape is also going to be tetrahedral. And this is what a, a tetrahedral shape looks like here. It's got these, you can notice here that when we look at it three dimensions, it's got um, these 109 degree angles between the uh, bonds of the molecule. And again, if we use the Serasbo, uh, we can uh, check that we've included all the aspects we need when we're explaining about how a molecule got a shape. It had uh, four electron density regions around the central atom. They were repelled as far as possible to produce an angle of 109. The overall, sorry, the base shape is tetrahedral. There are four of the regions are all bonding regions. So its overall shape is also tetrahedral. Let's look at the next example. In this next example, we're going to start with the tetrahedral base shape again. But in this case, there are four, so there are still four bonding regions because it's going to make a tetrahedral base shape. But notice in this case, we have um, one, two, three, four bonds around the central nitrogen atom. So if not four bonds, four regions of electron density. There are three bonding regions and one non-bonding region. So that's going to produce four electron density regions that push away from each other as far as possible. Now, they will produce angles. We will say they produce angles of 109. The actual reality, they do produce angles of about 107. This non-bonding region just pushes a wee bit harder than the other regions and just squashes the bottom bonds a bit closer to each other. So the angles are 107. But when we write our explanation, it's perfectly acceptable just to write 109 degree bond angles because that's what we remember for the base shape of a tetrahedral, 109 degree bond angles. In this case, that means that the base shape is tetrahedral, right? So it is making a tetrahedral shape apart from, you can notice here, look at this molecule, is one of the parts are missing, okay? So only three of the four regions are bonding so it actually makes an overall shape of what we call trigonal pyramid or, or trigonal pyramidal. If we use the, um, let me see if I can get this molecule turning here. There we go. The trigonal pyramidal shape, uh, checking again with Serasbo. So I use that when I want to write uh, the shape of my molecule, uh, write a paragraph to explain it. Just check that I have all of those components here. Um, oh, animations for my 3D isn't going that well at the moment. Okay, anyway, let's look at the last shape that we need to know. That is a tetrahedral base shape again, but we have one, two, three, four regions around the central atom. Okay, so they're still going to repel each other as far as possible. Notice two of the regions are bonds and two of them are non-bonding pairs. So four electron density regions pushing as far away from each other as possible. Again, we say they're 109 degrees, but if I talk about what I did in the last part of the last slide, these non-bonding regions just push a bit more than the bonding regions. So the actual angle between the two bonds is 105 degrees. Now, the um, shape here, Remember, base shape is tetrahedral still, but when I take away these two parts at the top, overall the molecule is going to look like a V shape, or it's going to look bent when I only have two bonding regions out of four electron density regions around the central atom. And again, you can check to see whether I have included all the parts of the Serasbo, my acronym, in my explanation here for my four parts that I would need to if I was going to explain the shape in an exam. Okay, so the last part of this video where I'll just go look at lower structures, shapes, and 
polarity bonding sorry Lewis structures and bonding shapes and I'm just going to go over uh, polarity and then I'll stop this video and make a second video to follow this up so uh, how do we work out if a molecule is polar or nonpolar well I do the following the first thing I do is I draw the um, I look at the molecule and I look to see whether the molecule has two different atoms in it any two different atoms so if you go to the product table and you, and you put your finger on one atom and you put your finger on any other atom that it might bond to because they are two different atoms they will have two different electronegativities now electronegativity is a term that denotes the attraction that an atom has to its bonding pair of electrons that is, if you are more electronegative, you have a stronger attraction to the electrons than if you're less electronegative. If we have two atoms bonded together with difference in electronegativity, they produce something called a bond dipole. Um, and these bond dipoles can be arranged around an atom either symmetrically or asymmetrically. So as I go through this, see if we can recognize which molecules are symmetric and which molecules are asymmetric in the terms uh, when we use, sorry, in terms of bonding. When I look at a paragraph that I'm going to write for this, I'm going to use the acronym EBAC. Now EBAC is, reminds me of the four components I need to have in my uh, paragraph when I explain it. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, of course, electronegativity difference. I'm going to say if I have two atoms, there is electronegativity difference. Then I'm going to say that they produce a bond dipole, B. And I'm going to talk about if the molecule is asymmetric. And then whether the because it's asymmetric, the bonds do not cancel out. So we've got electronegativity difference, bond dipoles, asymmetric and cancelling out let's have a look at some examples here so here's an example of a molecule so here's a molecule drawn um, as a trigonal pyramid shape because this is a ammonia molecule remember it's got four electron density regions push away uh, equally from each other uh, with three of them bonding so it has this uh, 100 and seven or 109 degree angles here you can notice here that this molecule is we call this molecule asymmetric in general terms if all of the bonds aren't uh, sorry if all of the electron density regions aren't aren't bonds it's going to be asymmetric if all of the electron density regions are bonds it's most likely going to be symmetric so this molecule is asymmetric but what we can see here is this nitrogen is actually more electronegative than the hydrogen here. So I'm going to just put it as slightly negative. And since the hydrogens are slightly positive, we're going to actually donate them with these we uh, slightly positive symbols here. And then if I find that the nitrogen is slightly negative then the center of the negative charge for this molecule is going to be right here in the middle of the nitrogen but the center of the positive charge for this molecule is going to be right here in between in the middle of the three hydrogen atoms now notice the center of the negative and the center of the positive are in different places these are said to be two different poles okay so these are two different poles the positive pole and the negative pole because they are in different places these two poles this molecule is said to be polar but remember I said this molecule was asymmetric when I explain this I can explain this in the following way I can say but because this molecule is asymmetric well let's start with the we'll start with the atoms first because nitrogen and hydrogen are bonded and they have a difference in electronegativity, they produce a bond dipole. Now, because the molecule is asymmetric, these bond dipoles do not cancel and this molecule is polar. So I'm using the acronym EBAC here. 
there is an electronegativity difference between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. This leads to a bond dipole between the hydrogen and the nitrogen that comes about because they are unequally sharing the bonding electrons. Remember, the nitrogen here has a stronger attraction to the bonding electrons. That's what a, that's what a more electronegative means. So it has an unequal share because it spend, the electrons spend more time closer to the nitrogen. Then uh, the A part here is this molecule is asymmetric. So if we have electronegativity difference between two atoms that produced bond dipoles and the molecule is asymmetric, we are then going to have the bond dipoles cancel out. Or sorry, in this case, do not cancel out. So this molecule is polar. OK, so let's look at the polar polarity of another molecule here. <clears throat> we have a tetrahedral shape. We've got a carbon in the middle with uh, four chlorine atoms around it. Um, essentially, if we ever have a, um, a base shape that has all of its bonds around it and no lone pairs, it's going to be symmetrical if the atoms are identical around the outside. Now, in this case, we can draw uh, bond dipoles. Uh, the positive end is going to be the carbon, and the negative end is going to be the chlorine because the chlorine is more electronegative than the carbon. So it's going to share the bonding electrons unevenly and take a bigger share the chlorine is. So we're going to say it gets slightly negative, and the carbon in the middle becomes slightly positive. Now, if this is a symmetrical molecule like we said it was, these four slightly negative charges will all be trying to pull the electrons towards them, the electron clouds. But because they um, are equally pulling uh, at the same angle away from the center, actually the center of the negative charge is going to be right here in the middle of the carbon atom. That's the, the, the negative pole. Now, when we do the positive pole, the center of the positive charge is going to be right where the carbon is as well. So because the two poles are at the same place, it doesn't have two separate poles or it's nonpolar. This is a nonpolar molecule. And the reason it's nonpolar, remember, is because we have these bond dipoles produced by the electronegativity difference of the atoms and they unequally share the electrons. And when the bond dipoles are symmetrically arranged around the central atom, they're going to cancel each other out and the overall molecule will be nonpolar. Remember, we can remember all the key components that we need to write for our explanation using the acronym EBAC. E meaning there is a difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the chlorine which means they share the bonding electrons unequally and produce a bond dipole. That's B. A is the overall symmetry is either is symmetrical. So A is an asymmetrical symmetrical. In this case, it's symmetrical. Remember, because it's a base shape. And it's, sorry, it's got all the bonds in the base shape. And then we're going to talk about whether they cancel or they don't cancel. In this case, the bond dipoles do cancel, so it is symmetrical. Okay, so let's have a look at next example here. What we see is a molecule that at first appearances looks like a tetrahedral. So it's a, all of the bonds are around the tetrahedral shape, so it could be symmetrical, but it isn't symmetrical. Now, the reason it isn't symmetrical is actually we have two different types of atoms around the central carbon, so it's going to be asymmetric. Now, what that means is there are two different types of bonds in this molecule. There's a carbon-hydrogen bond and a carbon-chlorine bond. <clears throat> the electronegativity difference between a carbon and a chlorine is different than the electronegativity difference between a carbon and a hydrogen. Because of the differences of these bond dipoles or their bond strengths here. Uh, so we notice here this one's a stronger bond dipole and it's pointing down this way to make it negative. And these ones are smaller bond dipoles, but they're in the opposite direction. So these bond dipoles are not equal. So we can see they're not going to cancel each other out. 
and that's because the bond dipoles are arranged asymmetrically. So the best way to explain this is to say that we have a molecule here that has two different types of bond dipoles, a carbon hydrogen bond dipole, which is a different strength to the carbon chlorine bond dipole. Because these two different types of bond dipoles are arranged asymmetrically around the carbon atom, they will not cancel out. And we have a polar molecule. Okay, thanks for listening to this video. I hope it's been helpful. I'm going to put out another video that will uh, look at the um, that's going to look at the types of solids and how we can explain the properties of solids. I look out for that in the next week. Well.